Hi, my name is David Lignell. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to solving partial differential equations with the spectral methods. So let's consider this uh, linear one-dimensional wave equation here. U is as a function of position and time. A is a wave speed. And we'll, we'll solve this with, a, with spectral methods. So for the first case, uh, we're going to use a constant a, and we're going to represent the solution u of x t as a summation of basis functions phi uh, times complex um, coefficients u hat. So the u hat can be functions of time, the basis functions are only functions of x, and in spectral methods we're going to take the um, basis functions to be these complex Fourier modes, e to the 2 pi i n x over l, which um, are equal to uh, cosine of 2 pi i n x over l plus i sine 2 pi n x i n x over l. So for a given n, uh, these uh, functions will be periodic on a domain of size l. So we're going to assume that our partial differential equation has boundary conditions that are periodic in the directions for which we apply spectral methods. As, uh, so we have a basis function for each n, <clears throat> and in general n would go from minus infinity to infinity, and as n changes, as n gets large, for example, the frequency increases. So you get more waves on this domain L as n increases. So we're going to use a truncated <coughs> form of the of this expansion here. So we're not going to include all possible waves um, and basis functions. We're only going to include those that go from minus big N over 2 plus 1 to N over 2. So we'll have a total of big N basis functions. And this results in this green equation. And uh, so then we're going to take this and <coughs> consider a, a spatial grid which has n points on it, and it's periodic over the domain L. So we're going to index starting from 0. And importantly, if we have a total of 8 points, then um, this L doesn't stop at point 0.7 here. It extends over a, another hypothetical point. And this point here is overlapping with point 0 because of the periodic domain. So delta x will be equal to the domain size divided by the number of intervals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 intervals, and we have 8 grid points, so that defines our delta x. And so the <clears throat> grid points xj is equal to j times delta x, so if we have uh, x5 will be equal to 5 delta x's, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And um, delta x is L over N, so we um, have a way of representing the grid here. Now we're going to index, we're going to denote point uj, the u of xj uh, is going to be denoted u sub j. Okay. <clears throat> the inverse Fourier transform of u hat, uh, these coefficients, um, evaluated at the grid points and denoted by f minus 1 is given as shown here. So we have this inverse discrete Fourier transform and um, we can, that is, we can recover the grid solution u sub j if we know the uh, big N Fourier coefficients um, u hat. Okay, the corresponding discrete Fourier transform, so this is the inverse discrete Fourier transform, which takes us from the spectral space u hat n to the physical space uj, and the corresponding discrete Fourier transform goes the other way. That'll take us from the physical space solution u hat at the grid points to, uh, sorry, u at the grid points j to the uh, Fourier modes, these Fourier coefficients u hat n. Okay? The difference between these is here there's a positive here, a positive power, here it's a negative power, and you have this normalization factor um, root n. Now usually these are going to be evaluated using some packaged fast Fourier transform routines. Um, here we're going to use Python. 
Okay, so we're going to insert, so these define the inverse discrete Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform. We're going to take our green PD, our green expansion of U here and insert it into this PDE. So put the green equation into the PDE. And when we do that, we get, we have um, uh, the time portion on the left and the space space portion on the right. So there's no time derivative that shows up in this Fourier mode, but the coefficient u hat can be a function of time. So the this comes out of the derivative and you're left with du hat dt. On the right hand side, the space the derivative of this Fourier mode with respect to space um, again these u hats are not functions of space so they come out of the derivative and then the derivative of this Fourier mode with respect to space is a coefficient times the original Fourier mode. So we would call this Fourier mode an eigenfunction of the um, uh, derivative operator. Okay, so we can combine these two, the left side and the right side, factor out the e to the 2 pi i n x over l, and um, <clears throat> and this results in these this quantity in parentheses needs to be equal to zero itself. You can argue that in a couple of ways, one of which is the fact that these um, functions here, uh, these, eigen, these Fourier modes are um, orthogonal over the domain, so each coefficient of these functions needs to be zero. Anyway, so this term here in parentheses is the, becomes this blue equation, and this is our uh, transformed version of the PDE. So this PDE has become an ODE is great. We have an ODE for each uh, Fourier mode u hat n, or Fourier coefficient u hat n. Now this this ODE, everything here is a constant, so this has an analytic solution. It's u hat n as a function of t equals u hat n at the beginning times e to the uh, 2 pi i n over l times the wave speed a times the time and if we solve this, if we can evaluate this for any time, and then we know an array of u hat uh, at any time, and we can compute the corresponding u of x at any time by taking the inverse discrete Fourier transform. So that's a spectral method applied to this uh, PDE. Now let's look at another case. This time we'll allow a to be a function of x, instead of a being a constant. Now if we do that, the previous approach isn't going to work. In the development, we assumed that u hat was independent of x, but with a of x, um, with a as a function of x, um, the previous solution of u hat would sort of imply that the u hat was a function of x, which contradicts the assumption. So you can go and you can see that if you take it through this approach here that's listed, if a is a function of x, it doesn't work. Um, the PDE itself is linear when a is a function of x, but the right hand side involves a product of functions of x. So you could think of it as nonlinear in terms of functions of x, it's just linear in terms of u itself. So this product of, uh, let's go back to the PDE, this product of a as a function of x and du dx is going to make it um, really difficult to deal with the uh, transformation. Okay. Similar issues arise from nonlinear terms. If we had u times du dx, that occurs as well. So the solution to this is to use the so-called pseudo-spectral method, and sometimes called the collocation method. And here we solve the problem in physical space, but we're going to evaluate the derivatives in spectral space. So we kind of switch between the two. So on the right-hand side of the PDE, we're going to write u in terms of its um, discrete Fourier transform. So we have du dt is a du dx, and uh, here we'll just let a be a function, a be a constant again. It can it can be a function of x or not, and the method still works. So we've used we've made a as a function of x to motivate this new approach, but it doesn't have to be. So we have write a as 
sorry, the right hand side is a times du dx, and then we um, fill in this expansion from the green equation, basically substitute the green equation in here, and we get a u hat of um, 2 pi i n over l times e to the 2 pi i n x over l. Um, <clears throat> and notice that we haven't done that to the left side, so we've only done the approximation on the right. At this point, the pseudo-spectral method evaluates the equation at the grid point, so we're going to evaluate this equation at grid points j, so we'll plug in x sub j and u sub j here, and we get this equation. And then we can swap the order of the terms u hat and 2 pi i n over l, so we'll just swap these out, and write <clears throat> u hat in terms of the u j using the uh, u hat is the Fourier transform of u j. <clears throat> okay, so let's just take a second and compare these two equations here. So this stays and this stays, and we recognize um, this equation u hat times this guy as being the inverse Fourier transform because u hat is the inverse, for, sorry, u hat is the Fourier transform of uj. Okay. But this whole thing here, this right-hand side itself is just the inverse discrete Fourier transform of this term in parentheses. Okay. So this is useful because we can say we're basically writing the thing in terms of u sub j, and you'll notice that the whole equation now is written in terms of u, u physical space coordinates. So du dt is a inverse Fourier transform of 2 pi i n over L times the Fourier transform. Okay, so what we've effectively done is we started with a derivative here, and by taking the, you could think of inserting, right here we've effectively done the inverse Fourier transform times the Fourier transform of this quantity. But taking the Fourier transform of the derivative, we have an analytic uh, result here where we have 2 pi i n over L comes out resulting in uh, just f of uj where this is the Fourier transform. So this is the magic of this pseudo spectral method is everything stays in the physical space but we are going to have to convert between we are going to have to take Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms and this works because the fast Fourier transform is fast. Okay now we'll note that this f of uj, this itself, this whole quantity highlighted here, is an array which is indexed by n. And this term here is an array indexed by n. And so this product is going to be, you just multiply it element-wise. And that results in this whole thing being an array indexed by n. And when you take the, Fourier, the inverse discrete Fourier transform of that, you get um, an array in the physical coordinate index by j. Okay, great. So this is the essence of this pseudo-spectral method. And again, right in between the a and the du dx, if you just write f minus 1 times f of this quantity and then evaluate the, the derivative, you end up with this blue equation. Okay. So the exponent, you have to be a little bit careful in doing this. The exponent of the of e in this inverse Fourier transform is an angle in the complex plane. And this multiplicative factor n in the exponent effectively steps around, steps the angle around the circle in the complex plane. So there's a little figure here to illustrate that. So let's look at this again. Um, the exponent here, this is going to be cosine this whole quantity is cosine of this quantity, the exponent, plus i sine of this exponent. So the argument here is effectively an angle. And as you increase n, you're stepping around the complex plane, the angle in that complex plane. Okay, 
So, and you've got things indexed here. So I've shown a, I'm showing a picture that shows the complex plane indexed by little n for an even number of points and for an odd number of points. And so point zero, one, two, three, minus two, minus one. So that ordering when we go from little n equals n over two plus one, that's minus two all the way up to n over 2 in those previous summations that we showed. Let's go back and show those right here. n goes from, that should be a negative right there, n goes from minus n over 2 plus 1 up to n over 2. We go from minus n over 2 plus 1 all the way up to n over 2. <clears throat> and if you're uh, an odd number of points, it starts right here. Okay, comes over. So the vertical dashed lines here um, connect points that have conjugate symmetry. So if we're taking, if we have a real signal u, then u hat, u hat needs to have conjugate symmetry so that the inverse discrete Fourier transform of u hat gives cancellation of the imaginary parts. That is, you want, if u is real, then when you convert it and then convert it back, you need to recover a real valued function. And that will happen if these points here have conjugate symmetry and the visual kind of illustrates which of those points um, correspond to each other. So you can see that um, in Python, I'll show that for sort of a five point um, stencil here. In Python, if you uh, scipy.fft and ifft, we'll just get a u of five random points and compute u hat is fft of u and then print them out. You can see that the first point has a zero imaginary part then the second point and the last point have conjugate symmetry, meaning their values are the same except for the sign. And then this third point and the fourth point have conjugate symmetry. So if we go back and look, the first point is zero, then the first, the next point and this one have the same value with a different sign, and then these two have the same value and a different sign. So zero, same value, different sign, and same value, different sign. So the little tests like this are useful to make sure that you can kind of see what it's doing and what the order of, order of these things are. And uh, different packages will arrange things a little differently. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this thing then. Um, we'll solve the PDE before we'll use the exact same approach of case two, the pseudo-spectral method. But we'll use a constant a just because. Okay, so I'm going to import uh, some Python imports here. We'll integrate the ODEs with ODE int. Here's some code, and I'm applying this to a function that's the initial condition is this one over cosh. So it's basically just a spike in the domain. That's our initial condition, and we're it's a periodic domain. And it's a wave, so this wave is going to basically move, and it's as it goes periodic, it comes back through on itself. So I'm basically running it. The runtime here, the speed is one, the domain is ten, and I'm going to run it for um, the runtime here goes up to ten. So I'm basically running one domain cycle, it goes through the domain and ends right back where it started. And you can see the exact solution is in red. And the spectral method here is in uh, the symbols, and it does a pretty good job. So let's go ahead and run it and run this. And when we do that, whoops, figures, huh? Go back and run the code. There we go. That's better. Okay, and you can change the number of points here. So here we have um, nx is 32. Let's change it to like 8. Fourier transforms like powers of 2, so 8 is friendly. And you can see, even with only a few modes, the solution isn't really well represented by only having the points spaced the way they are, but the points land right where they should, which is pretty remarkable. So only a few modes does a pretty good job. Okay, let's try something else, something a little more complicated. 
we'll do the viscous Burgers equation. So this one's nonlinear. We have u times du dx. And then we have this uh, kinematic viscosity here times the second derivative of u with respect to x. So this one's nonlinear. We'll make nu be 0.1, and we'll let the domain again be L, and we'll solve it for one flow through time again. And we'll use an initial condition of this cosine function as our initial condition. Okay, this one happens to have an exact solution. Wikipedia shows it as this scary looking formula. You have the logarithms of integrals of integrals and the derivative of that. And here I solved for this. I evaluated this using SymPy. Here's the code if you want to pause and scrutinize it. You can see that. And the spectral solution is going to be, um, again, wherever we have a derivative, we're just going to take f inverse times f. And the second derivative is going to be f inverse times f. And uh, you end up with... Um, the first derivative gives you this 2 pi i n over l. And when you take a second derivative, you basically get that exponent twice, 2 pi i n over l squared. And this one has a negative in front because you do it once, and this one the negative cancels because you do it twice. So pretty straightforward. And then to code this, here, let's go back up and see our code for the last one look at it a little bit more. So we make a right-hand side function. And this right-hand side function, we're going to return again. Sorry, I'm jumping around on you. We're solving again this um, one-dimensional wave equation, this thing. So my right-hand side is that. It's actually, this is my right-hand side that I'm solving. A times inverse Fourier transform of this quantity. So in code, that shows up in one line of code. So we have the right-hand side function. We pass in the array u, the array of the uh, current time. And then we return minus a times the inverse fast Fourier transform, 2 pi i. i in Python is 1j, confusingly. n over l. n is an array. And the FFT of u. So we're taking advantage of array multiplication in Python. Now, when you do this, IFFT, FFT, you're going to get complex numbers. It's just that the complex parts, the imaginary parts, are basically 0 times j. So to force everything to be real, we just take this whole quantity uh, here and dot real. That'll strip off the 0 j's off the end of it. And then just hit it with ODE int. So you can look up how to use ODE int separately. We give it this right-hand side function, our initial condition, the times that we're interested in solving it at, and we get the solution that we just looked at. So it looks really similar for the uh, Burgers equation. We, here we're going to make it a, a function. So we pass in the number of points that we want to solve it with, <coughs> the domain, the viscosity, the end time. Um, the solution domain in the initial condition, we create a right-hand side function where we go minus u times the inverse Fourier transform, 2 pi i n over l fft of u dot real again, minus new inverse Fourier transform, that quantity squared, fft of u, the real again. So again, one line of code. Give it an initial condition sorry, times we want to solve it at, hit it with ODE int, and then return the answer. There we go. So pretty slick. There's one little caveat here, and that is um, uh, when we multiply by n, we need to make sure that n is this range that goes from big N over minus big N over 2 plus 1 to big N over 2. So here I'm just setting up that array n to be the right, the right array. And that is um, that's consistent with this picture that we showed uh, that we showed here before this one. Okay, so we want n to go this way in the array. There's a little bit of code there that does that. Okay, great. So we're almost done. So it's fun to compare this spectral method to um, 
a finite difference method. So here's a solution. Okay, well let's look at the plot first. So my initial condition was a, a cosine wave. And then the exact solution is shown as the red line. That comes from that um, psi pi solution of the equation from Wikipedia. And then we have the spectral solution here, which is basically identical. And then it's, it's convenient to compare it to a finite difference solver. So here's a finite difference solver where we just use central differences for the spatial derivative and then hit it again with ODE int. So come back to our Berger's equation. We're just going to solve this as central difference on this derivative. So ui plus 1 minus ui minus 1 divided by 2 delta x. And this one, uh, ui minus 1 minus 2 ui plus ui plus 1 divided by delta x squared. And that's our right hand side. And then that's what we've coded here in the finite difference solver. So um, again, we're using some array these arrays as index arrays. So we have the array of i's, the array of i plus 1, accounting for the periodicity. So i p is i plus 1. And then the last i p is the first i because it's periodic. And the same thing for i minus. i minus is i minus 1. And the first i minus is the same as the last one. And then you can just plug these in. So u times i p minus i m over 2 delta x. And then I m minus 2 ui i p over delta x squared and hit it with ODE int again. Because these are functions, we can change the number of x's and vary that. So I'm going to do that over a range of grids. Grids with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 14, etc. total grid points. And um, then we'll plot the average relative error. Uh, as a function of the number of points. And we get this plot here. Now I'm doing this on a log-log scale. On a log-log scale, the finite difference method has a um, has a uh, power law fit where the slope is nominally minus 2 because it's a second order finite difference approximations. The um, spectral method, on the other hand, has this uh, exponential fit. The error decays exponentially with the number of grid points. So it's super, uh, super high convergence rate. And you can see that with, um, what is this, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. At around 80 or 90 points, we've hit the maximum possible solution on this machine, where you start having uh, just limited by round off error. And we are, I don't know, how many orders of magnitude is that? Like six or so orders of magnitude more accurate than the finite difference solution. So a million times more accurate with 80 points. And with fewer than that number of points, you can see, or, or conversely, for a given accuracy, you can see the number of points that you need. And it's about a factor of 10 speed up in the number of points for a given level of accuracy. So kind of cool and super easy to apply. I know there's a little bit more development in terms of the equations um, and the ideas behind it. It's a lot harder than a finite difference method. But actually implementing the thing, if you have a periodic domain, is trivial. Just, I, just FFT, multiply by this, IFFT, and there's your right-hand side. And then just feed it to an ODE integrator. It's great. So hopefully this is a little bit helpful of a crash course slash introduction to using spectral methods. Let me know if you have comments on how we can make it better. But uh, And uh, appreciate your time. Good, happy computing.